I think you can see why we were so excited because um, there was so, many, so much innovation. Um, I think the other thing was, was there was people really who were quite cutting edge. I mean, if you look at search engine um, competition, uh, it really is is something which is state of the art and sort of we're leaders in it in this field and design again. Um, one of the things which pleases me immensely is to be able to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, I must admit, I was brought up as a little boy and I used to go to markets. And uh, one of my joys was actually understanding markets from a kid and sort of seeing people trade. And um, really, I think, also entertaining the audience. I think the other thing was, was um, probably it's uh, been something which I've always found a joy, actually marketing products, bringing things to market, whatever they are. It's a very exciting area. It's a very demanding area, and I think that... Um, people have built up their professions and, and their businesses in, in that area and I think that it's one which is constantly changing as well. So I'd probably like to introduce one of the masters of his craft in really bringing things to market and if you like matching community needs and uh, dealing with good honest people and sort of trading with them effectively. Um, it is my absolute delight to introduce Malcolm Walker. Well, to be honest, I don't go very much after dinner speaking. I prefer to drink the uh, red wine through the meal. Um, I've actually been told to speak for 40 minutes, which seems an awful long time to me, but I think it's going to seem even longer for you. Anyway, here goes. Um, after all, I, I might well need the practice, because in five days' time, I'm off to climb Mount Everest. Well, try. Uh, and when I get back in June, I, I might want to embark on a new career as one of those full-time motivational speakers, you know, enthralling people with the story of how I cut my arm off with a Swiss army knife or, or something. Um, on the other hand, given the risks involved, uh, there's also a possibility that this will turn out to be the last afternoon speech I ever give. So, uh, so make the most of it. I accepted the invitation to speak tonight because it came from David Briggs, the founder of the awards, who is an old pal of mine. I'm all in favour of enterprise and of it being encouraged by awards, though I very much doubt whether I would have ever won one myself, because I notice that they are targeted at organisations rather than the individuals. And I'm an individual, I'm an entrepreneur, and entrepreneurs, in my view, provide the lifeblood of our economy. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. Last year we held a, a bit of a party to mark the 40th anniversary of Iceland which is, I suppose, my greatest achievement as an entrepreneur. But it didn't start there. I was an entrepreneur years before I had ever heard the fancy French name for what I was doing. I started by organising dances when I was about 14 at school. And the first time I did it for charity, and the next time I did it for me as a money-making venture. And I got quite good at it, booking the acts and selling the tickets. So much so that some bloke I'd never heard of approached me out of the blue and suggested we go into partnership. His name was Peter Stringfellow. And every now and again I posed to wonder how different my life had been if I'd have taken up his offer. Um, I always used to exaggerate how badly I did at Murfield Grammar School, claiming to have left with one O level in woodwork. In fact, it was four after four attempts. But I certainly wasn't an academic star and there was no question of my staying on to do A-levels or go to university. The careers teacher asked me, what are you good at? I said, uh, I like organising things. And she said, well, in that case, you should go into retailing. I, I never thought to question her advice. And I was delighted to get a job as a, a management trainee at Woolworths. At that time, it was one of the biggest and most successful retailers in the country. And this was the important bit, it had the best paid managers. Uh, my career progression was quite slow, but I had a couple of uh, profitable sidelines, continuing to organise my dances and selling potatoes, which was my first venture into the food industry. There were no garden centres to speak of in those days, and every spring tons of seed potatoes would be sold over the Woolies gardening counter, and at the end of the season we had about half a tonne left, so I asked the store manager if I could have them planted them in my dad's field, employed the kids from the village to harvest them, 
and then sold them back to the Woolies Canteen. So every morning I got to walk a mile to get the bus for, for, uh, to Huddersfield carrying a sack of potatoes. And I got 10 shillings or 50p for each sack, which was good money in those days. After a while I, I got fed up uh, with my old school pal sticking the mickey out of the fact that I was pushing the brush around the uh, uh, floor as I cleared up spillages. It didn't seem much like management training to them and eventually I began to feel the same way and had a word with the store manager. And it turned out that the deputy manager who took me on had moved to another store without ever bothering to tell anybody that I was a management trainee. Uh, <laughs> After that, things looked up a bit, so fast forward to 1969, and I'd risen to the dizzy heights of deputy manager at Woolworths in Wrexham. I married my childhood sweetheart, Rhiannith, in October, and brought her back from honeymoon in Ibiza um, to the farm cottage that I'd rented as our first home together. And there was a sticky moment when it finally dawned on her that I hadn't been joking about the outside toilet. The problem was that I didn't like my boss at Wrexham and he didn't like me. Uh, not only was I working every hour I got sent uh, for six days a week, but on the seventh uh, I'd got to go and check the store. Uh, I crashed my van a year earlier and I hadn't been able to replace it so I had to go into town on the bus. And if I ran like hell I could check the store and get back home on the same bus. And if, if I missed it that was my afternoon gone. Uh, so no wonder I was beginning to feel I was in a rut and I'd wasted seven years of my life. And at this point I met a kindred spirit, Peter Hinchcliffe, another trainee manager who was deputy manager at Woolworths in Oswald Street. And our business partnership started by accident on Saturday night when we were heading out for a drink in Farndon in my newly acquired car. And we spotted a strawberry seller at the side of the road packing up. On impulse, we stopped and bought his remaining stock, about six trays. And then the next day, we drove to the Horseshoe Pass and set up our own store. And we didn't sell any. Until Peter and myself decided to hide behind the wall and left it to my wife and Peter's girlfriend and then strawberries were gone in half an hour. And that taught me a lesson about sex appeal in retailing. The profits from that first venture were spent in the pub that lunchtime but it set us thinking about what to do next. And we tried some rather dodgy ideas. We had started a chain litter, which didn't work. And then we found a, an aerosol spray, which made frying pans non-stick. We tried to sell that, and that didn't work. And then we hit on the idea of selling loose frozen food. And I'd seen that in Lewis's department store in Leeds. And that's an important lesson for budding entrepreneurs. You don't need to have an original idea. You just pin somebody else's idea and do it better. Most people didn't have freezers in those days, so the idea was that you could pop in and buy something for your tea that night. Selling frozen food loose with no packaging and no waste, we could offer better value than the supermarkets. And from our point of view, we could sell the goods for cash before we had to pay our supplier, so our capital investment was not very much. And my share of the initial rent shop fitting and other startup costs was £30. So we opened that first Iceland shop in Oswald Street on November the 18th, 1970, and we never looked back. But our big break came in January 1971, when we were summoned to Woolworths head office, that found out what we were doing, and we got fired. Uh, by Mr. A.V. Green, who was the nearest person to God that I'd ever come across, and he gave me a speech about wasting a great opportunity in life, and I gave him a speech about the 10,000 hours in unpaid overtime that he owed me, but he wasn't impressed and he just sacked me with the words, so I'll go and run your fish and chip shop or whatever it is. <laughs> Getting sacked provided just the incentive we needed to get on and open some more ice stores. And we opened our second shop in Rail, our third one in Flint, and we just kept moving the business onwards and upwards. Although we kept looking sideways at other money-making ideas, from our takeaway food shop, serving the late night drunks of Osrestry, to the Casanova Pizza restaurant in Rill, with its attractive waitresses in tight t-shirts and its wine list proclaiming, a meal without wine is like a night without love. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that it would be the boring old frozen food shop that made it through to the 40th anniversary? So by 1975, with 15 stores, and by 1980, it was 37. We had some offers to buy the business along the way, but we decided the next 
logical step was to go public and we floated on the London stock market. And it was one of the most successful flotations of all time, oversubscribed 113 times. Or to put it another way, we only wanted to raise £8 million and we got checks in for over £900 million. So, do you know how to ensure that what they now call the initial public offering of your company is a roaring success? You employ an advisor who will underprice it. And then you can enjoy that classic mix of emotions uh, that we experienced as we saw the share price rocketing uh, and then realised that the shares we'd sold uh, on the float um, had gone so cheaply. And after that, our next big involvement with the city was in 1988 when we bid for BGEN. Up to then we'd grown mainly organically, though we had bought one or two small chains of shops along the way, but BGEN was the big one, about two and a half times our size. I'd been talking to John Apthorpe, the founder and chairman, for a few years, but we'd never been able to do, do a deal, so we decided to make a hostile bid. And it couldn't have been a more nail-biting finish. At the wire, in January 1989, we won by 50.01%, uh, making Iceland a truly national business. And we kept on growing. In 1992, I was able to write in the annual report that it had been another brilliant year for Iceland. And I remember somebody did mention the word hubris and nemesis, but that's all Greek to me. And things certainly got harder for us as we moved into the mid-1990s, thanks to retail deregulation, extending uh, opening hours and Sunday trading, and the arrival of the continental discounters in the UK. And at this point, I'll confess, uh, I made a potentially fatal mistake. I began to think that perhaps the business had outgrown my skills, and I called in the management consultants. And if you only take one lesson away from this speech, don't ever go down that particular route. It was worse than that though. I was so convinced that these people were the experts and so impressed by their way with PowerPoint presentations that I, I, I poached the head of the team and persuaded him to join Iceland as our trading director. He was the most intelligent man I've ever met, but I soon realized he couldn't even run a chip shop. It cost me a golden hello to get rid of him and a golden goodbye to get rid of him two years later. He cost me a golden hello to employ him and a golden goodbye to get rid of him two years later. And he's now head of retail at one of the biggest accountancy firms. Well, in the middle of all that, in 1996, we reported our first ever drop in pre-tax profits, just over 20%. It was our first slip up after 25 years of absolutely consistent growth. And that's a record that very few companies, public or private, can match. And you'd think the city would forgive us for that, but of course you'd be wrong. The city is a very unforgiving place, and as far as they were concerned, it was the end of the world. The analysts who had lauded Iceland as a growth stock for more than 10 years suddenly started asking why we existed at all. Because fundamentally, the city has got the same values as the Sunday tabloid press. You're either a megastar or a fallen star, and there's nothing I like better than kicking you when you're down. Which is not to say that entrepreneurs should not look to float the companies when the time is right. It can be a great way of taking money out and involving your staff in share ownership, raising your profile, improving your covenant, and generally challenging yourself, which is never a bad thing. But having run at Iceland as a private company for 14 years, then a public company for 17 years, and now we've been private again for six years, I know which I prefer. And the worst thing about having a stock market quote is that it's a recipe for short-termism and for doing things that will flatter this year's profits, even though you know that they're wrong for your customers and for the business in the long run. Added to which, you have to read searing insights like my particular favourite from the then top financial journalist Patience Wheatcroft, now a Conservative peer who announced to her readers that Iceland was doomed because people were now going elsewhere for their chiabatti and sun-dried tomatoes. They certainly are in Wigan the talk of little else. <laughs> so after the management consultant was paid to go away, I reverted to trusting my own instincts and came up with a load of utterly balmy ideas that were comprehensively rubbish by the experts. And this is another important lesson for would-be entrepreneurs. Never be afraid to do something because other people think it's mad. I think we're all mad at Iceland, but it works. 
We bought a food service company, Woodwoods. We tied up with a cancer research campaign to promote the health benefits of frozen vegetables. And most importantly, we introduced a home delivery service. The initial reaction of the city analysts was brilliant, but only because they thought that it would allow middle class housewives to sit down at their computers and order their weekly shop online. Remember this was 1996, things were a bit different. The city could understand that way of shopping. The crazy thing about our system was that the customers still came into the store, did their shopping, paid for it at the checkout and then left it there for us to deliver later. And the city folk looked open mouthed and said, why? They couldn't begin to get their minds around the idea that in the real world, in places like Liverpool and Oldham, there are working class housewives who go shopping on the bus. Did someone just ask what's a bus? <laughs> Take my word for it. That struggling onto one with a screaming kid in a buggy and half a dozen bags of melting frozen food is no fun at all. And our home delivery service was a godsend. And today we make over seven and a half million home deliveries every year. It's our most successful innovation ever. But it shouldn't work. Our in-house accountant tried to stop me from doing it because the numbers don't stack up. The minimum spend is only £25, delivery is free, and we deliver up to 10 miles. And that's a recipe for financial suicide. But the reality is quite different. The average spend is actually £52, and the actual delivery distance is only two miles. And these are our, our most loyal and our biggest spending customers. We had loads of other crazy ideas as well. Uh, we were the first food retailer in Britain to provide a nationwide home shopping service. We did launch an internet service uh, eventually. Um, and we were the first national food retailer in the world to ban genetically modified ingredients in our products. We were the first food retailer in Britain to ban mechanically recovered meat and all sorts of other nasty things, including hydrogenated trans fats and artificial colours and frailers. And you wouldn't think that from Iceland, would you? But there you are. By 2000, I was in my mid-50s, and I'd been running Iceland for 30 years. And I got the idea into my head that I wanted to retire. And that's the biggest mistake that I ever made. So here's some genuinely useful advice for you. Don't ever retire. It's very boring. And accidents apart, I'm now planning on being around to celebrate Iceland's Diamond Jubilee in 2030. But I've not gained such wisdom then, so I cast around for an exit route and I spotted a cash and carry business called Booker, which I thought had potential. And it also had the advantage of bringing with it a highly rated chief executive who could take over from me. His name was Stuart, Stuart Rose. Hoping to transplant Stuart to Deeside, over 200 miles from the Ivy in Harrisburg, was a bit like trying to get a bird of paradise to reacclimatise to the Arctic. And once I took him to visit some of our North Wales stores, Shotton, Flint, Hollywell, Rill. <laughs> Big mistake. He thought it was the third world and he duly buggered off after only six months off the job. So needing a replacement in a hurry, I hired the highly recommended guy who supposedly turned around wicks after a ma massive financial crisis and it was free because that company had just been taken over. And very soon afterwards Iceland was spookily plunged into its own massive financial crisis and I was in big trouble. Thirty years almost to the day after I was sacked from Woolworths, I was fired from Iceland. The trouble was that I sold some of my Iceland shares in the belief that the business was on course to make a profit of about 120 million. And instead, it made a loss of about the same amount after an astonishing 145 million in exceptional items. Some of that was pension write offs, but there were over 65 million of assorted provisions. And the truly amazing thing is that uh, none of those provisions were found to be needed and they were just quietly fed back into profits in the following two or three years. And in fact, in 2002, they accounted for 68% of what little profit that business made. But the net result of this was that I spent three and a half years under investigation by the SFA and the SFO. SFO, if you don't know what that is, it's the Serious Fraud Office. Although, in fact, I had two meetings with them, followed by three years of complete silence, before they decided there was nothing wrong, 
the fact that they communicated to me by post with a second class stamp. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the big food group, as Iceland had been renamed, went to the dogs in truly spectacular style. And you can read all about it on our website in a special section called The Dark Ages, which has been there for more than five years without attracting a writ for libel. So I think we can safely conclude that it's all true. And the cultural difference between the old and current management style of Iceland and that adopted by the big food group was simply phenomenal. They ticked every corporate box going, frankly, we don't. They sent out board packs two inches thick, carried out to all the directors 48 hours in advance. We don't even have an agenda for our board meetings. We spent time telling jokes and make the most important decisions in the corridor or in the pub. In other words, they were a proper company with all the processes and procedures that you would expect, while our management style is freer. Some might say chaotic, but it achieves results. And the critical difference is that our style is one that encourages ideas, and ideas are the lifeblood of enterprise and entrepreneurship. For every hundred ideas that we have, there might only be four or five that actually work, but it's what keeps us ahead of the competition and keeps our business moving forward. You want people working for you who are creative and who aren't afraid to speak their mind. Uh, glass half full people rather than negatively minded. You want thinkers and doers rather than commentators and spectators who just point out the flaws in other people's bright ideas and heaven knows there's enough of that type of people around. Anyway, meanwhile, um, myself and a few out of work colleagues set up my second frozen food business, Cool Trader, uh, a discount frozen food chain with now got over 50 stores and it's part of the Iceland family. Anyway, by 2004, it was clear that the big food group was in serious danger of going bust. It had got a £250 million overdraft facility with a £1,000 headroom. And early in 2005, the shareholders were wisely accepted an offer to take it private from a consortium uh, of Icelandic investors, just a coincidence, led by Bauger. Uh, they separated Booker from Iceland and invited me and two of my colleagues, Andy Pritchard and Tarzan Dalliwal, to come back and sort it out. And I must confess, I've got mixed feelings about it. I arrived back in my old office on the 11th of February 2005, which happened to be my 59th birthday. I got the flu, which didn't help. And to be honest, I wasn't sure that the business could be saved. But at least I've got a few ideas of where to start because in the two or three weeks before I went back, I actually went round a few Iceland stores to have a look and realised that everything that could be screwed up in the company had been screwed up. Um, neither the people who had been running the business nor the customers that we got left had got the slightest clue what Iceland is for. Were we a freezer centre? Were we a supermarket? Were we a discounter? Were we a convenience store? Nobody could tell. We were selling, or rather stocking, 17 different types of frozen lasagna, 11 types of frozen roast potato, and there were 9 different types of mayonnaise, not salad cream, mayonnaise, which is probably more than Asda sell. 4 types of feta cheese. And I went to look at Iceland and Kirby in Liverpool, the roughest part of Liverpool, and they were devoted in a whole metre of shelf space to Earl Grey tea. <laughs> it wasn't rocket science to work out what was wrong. We didn't have time for democracy. So I went into the Saddam Hussein mode for, Saddam Hussein mode for a period of ruthless dictatorship with a motto, JFDI. And you know what that means, just fucking do it. All that focus on process and procedure, it created a bloated bureaucracy at head office, which had grown from 800 people to 1,400 people, while sales had declined from 2 billion to 1.5 billion. It's now down to 500. My first move was I had to make 400 people redundant. And that wasn't about cost saving but about freeing up the decision-making process, getting rid of committees and steering groups so that we could actually get some action into the business. And the next thing I did at head office was maybe a bit more surprising. We spent £400,000 refurbishing the staff restaurant with the aim of creating simply the best staff restaurant in the country. 
Every day we serve grilled fish for £2.25, choice of other hot dishes, fresh pasta, sandwich bar, salad bar. Sometimes we have on the menu Chateaubriand, venison and grouse. And you can have as much fresh meat as you like, completely free. And it's a philosophy that we've applied through the business and it's based on the premise that if you look after the people well, they look after the customers and the profits look after themselves. And so far it seems to be working quite nicely. So right across the business we mapped out our five year plan, which was three words, four really. It's simplification, focus and accept reality. Don't delude yourself that the situation is different from what it really is. And also we wanted to have some fun. We closed a hundred of our less profitable stores. We pulled out of the Republic of Ireland because they had uh, euros and we couldn't understand that. We gave up home shopping. We got rid of our appliance division. We focused and we got rid of the convenience store offering fresh sandwiches, flowers, chilled pizza, pasta, chilled fish, newspapers, magazines and even My Little Pony toys. And we focused on frozen food because the clue's in the name, really. Iceland is a frozen food business. Not because we sell more of it than anything else, but because it's the main reason why people come to us. We put a lot more effort into new product development and into giving customers real reasons to visit Ireland, Iceland because we were offering something truly different. In the four years that I was away from Iceland, sales declined 25%. In the five financial years that we've reported since I've been back, like-for-like like sales have increased by 50%. We've grown our profit strongly as well, from a loss of 20 million the year I went back to an EBITDA figure this year of 190 million. The business is debt-free, we've got cash in the bank. And what's the key to all that success? Well, there's probably a clue in our ranking in this year's Sunday Times Best Companies to Work For survey where we came number six, up from 13th place last year. When I came back, we were a minimum wage employer and pretty much the last resort for a store manager. Frankly, working at Iceland was something of a joke. Now we're one of the best pairs on the high street and ask our staff if they're fairly paid, as the Sunday Times did, and we get the second best store in the whole country. On one measure, we even beat Goldman Sachs. As well as fair pay, we play great emphasis on having fun. Two years ago, we spent £4 million taking 800 of our store managers for a week's holiday, sorry, conference in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Every year at our conference, we unveil some great incentive for store managers. Uh, last year, we gave away a new Jaguar for the uh, best store manager, and we had £100,000 in cash to share amongst uh, the best performing stores. And the result of that is that our managers and staff are really highly motivated, well rewarded. 84% of our employees tell us that they're proud to work for Iceland and would recommend it as a good place to work. And we work together to raise money for charity as well. Every year in August there's a charity week in our stores where they do daft things to raise money. And last year they raised 740,000 for our charity of the year which was held for heroes last year and with a, a bit of input from the charity ball that we had at my house um, we raised a grant total of one and a half million for help for heroes and i'm hoping that we'll do even better this year our charity this year is research into alzheimer's disease because the scale of the dementia epidemic in this country is staggering there'll soon be a million sufferers meaning that it will touch more or less every family in the country and there's no real understanding of what causes it and no cure. And the amount invested in research every year is a tiny fraction of the sums being spent on other more fashionable um, charities. We're focusing specifically on early onset Alzheimer's because it's a particularly cruel form of the disease that can affect young people as young as 40. And because it allows researchers to focus on people who are suffering only from Alzheimer's rather than just as one of the multiple problems that usually affect people with Alzheimer's in old age. Now, I said that our staff do some crazy things to raise money each year, and, uh, but this year I'm pretty sure that I'm going to take the prize for the daftest stunt of all in trying to climb Mount Everest. I'm going with my son, and thank goodness ten other blokes who know what they're doing. 
Uh, and I'm definitely not on a suicide mission, so I've set myself the, the target of just getting to a point called the North Col, which is 23,000 feet. So, as I've said before, um, never be afraid to do something mad, challenging yourself, taking yourself out of your natural comfort zone. It's always good. And from what I've heard and seen, it doesn't come much less comfortable than the top of Everest. And you can read about this, and hopefully give us a tenner, if you just Google Iceland Everest, and you'll get to our website. There's loads of interesting stuff on Everest and what we're doing, and I'll be writing a blog every few days. And as I say, just log on, donate, and give us some money. Right, how to conclude? Well, I suppose a summary of the lessons I've learned uh, from over half a century as an active entrepreneur. First, formal, I shouldn't say this here, I should have, but formal qualifications don't matter as much as you might think. So if, if you've not got the MBA prize tonight, don't worry. Uh, every school leader I meet usually wants to go to university and progress from there into some respectable profession. Lawyer, accountant, or God forbid, management consultant. <laughs> you don't need a degree to be an entrepreneur. Just some ideas and enthusiasm and the willingness to work hard and persevere. So, beware of management consultants. Have faith in your own abilities. And thirdly, never retire. It's more dangerous than climbing Everest. <laughs> And fourthly, don't be afraid to do something mad. Don't be a slave to convention, rules and respectability. When I started out, people looked down on entrepreneurs as Jack the Lad. And they were also jealous of financial success. I remember buying my first Porsche and having a key run down the side of it every time I parked it. That was in the 70s. A British thing. And I'm sure you've heard the story before. In those days, if you saw a guy driving a Rolls Royce, people thought... Bastard. In America, they'd think, one day out I'm going to have one of those. And that's the difference. But attitudes are changing, helped by TV shows like The Apprentice and Dragon's Den. And envy certainly isn't the destructive force that it was back in the 70s. But I still think that as a nation, we hugely undervalue entrepreneurs. And as the government cuts take effect, and half a million jobs disappear from the public sector, it's the entrepreneurs of this country that is going to be needed to take up the slack. Since Iceland was founded, I reckon that we've provided jobs for more than a quarter of a million people directly, plus many thousands more at our suppliers. And totting up our bills, as I did recently, for pairs you earn and corporation tax, we've also handed over to the government about 1.75 billion in taxes, which is enough to pay for 30 new schools, uh, seven new hospitals, three and a half thousand cruise missiles, or to keep at least three thousand lesbian, gay and transgender diversity coordinators on the public payroll for more than a decade. <laughs> so if this country is going to pull itself out of its present economic mess, it needs to give more recognition to the fact that entrepreneurs are heroes, not villains, and that without them there will be no health service, no armed forces, no high-speed rail links, no cures for cancer or Alzheimer's, no infrastructure and no future. Anything we can do to encourage enterprise and creativity is to be greatly encouraged, which is why I'm so happy to be associated with the awards presented this evening and for having the opportunity for telling you my story. Thank you.